Hello everyone, my name is Amir Foruzan and I'm going to talk to you about converting smoke into fuel. So when I was in grade 7, my science teacher wrote on the board this very equation. It's reaction for burning. So you have a fuel, reacts with, reacts with air, and catches fire, produces smoke, carbon dioxide or CO2, as well as water vapor, H2O, and some heat and some light, different forms of energy. And then he went on and draw an arrow backward and said now we can convert put heat light into smoke and convert it back to fuel and i thought he's joking so i started laughing loud and because i laughed the whole class laughed and i almost got kicked out of the classroom so i find it interesting that i'm researching that very topic and if you're a teacher out there don't underestimate your influence so let's take a step back and understand the motivation behind this this research so there since the industrial revolution, there has been 1.5 trillion tons of carbon dioxide released into the atmosphere, increasing its concentration by about 50%. And why that's a problem? Carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas, blankets the planet, traps the sun's heat and warms it up. And that comes with some climate catastrophes and followed by mass migrations of people, very disruptive. And carbon dioxide can get dissolved into water and acidifies our oceans, and that could endanger marine life, including small creatures called planktons that are responsible for 50% of the oxygen that we breathe. And in general, carbon dioxide is an air pollution, so it's just the chemistry of the air that we're breathing is changing. So you might say, well, okay, let's just leave Earth and go to Mars as a solution, but the problem is Mars's atmosphere is 95% made of carbon dioxide too. So it's not so easy. Carbon dioxide is a pollutant, but can we see it as a resource? And if yes, how? So in this chart, I'm going to show you on the vertical axis the energy generation and consumption throughout the year for Canada. So during the sunny days of spring and summer, we get to produce a lot of renewable electricity from solar cells. There are more waters in the rivers, so more hydroelectricity. So the electricity generation is higher, demand not so much compared to the winter time where we have to heat up the buildings. There's a lot of demand for electricity and not so many sunny days, so electricity generation goes down. There is an asynchronicity between generation and consumption. So, and batteries are not so effective for long-term electricity storage. You might have noticed if you charge your laptop 100%, turn it off, leave it aside for a few days, you come back, it's not 100% anymore after a few days. So over the span of several months, that's even worse. So what if we use this extra electricity during the summer, spring time, use that energy to convert smoke into fuel, use that fuel during the winter time? That can be done in an electrolyzer. So it's an electrical device, you plug it in, has a negative terminal, positive terminal. From the negative terminal, you can feed it with carbon dioxide and water vapor. And as an output, you can get a th certain type of fuel depending on the parameters that you set. For example, ethanol, alcohol. On the positive terminal, you can feed it with water. And as the output, you can get oxygen. So just to give an analogy to simplify it, imagine carbon dioxide and water vapor are the small Super Mario. We're feeding them with electrons, those are the mushrooms. So after the conversion, they convert into a more energetic, a value-added product, and that goes to the output. So if you have this device on Mars, you can, and assuming you have access to water, you can breathe and get drunk. So what else you could ask for? Now the key to this technology is catalyst. The catalyst makes make the conversion more efficient. So imagine if the, the energy level of carbon dioxide and water is here, we want to go to something more energetic, more value added. And without catalyst, the barrier is very large, not economical. But with a good catalyst, you can make the process efficient, economical. So again, with Super Mario analogy, we want to get to the big Super Mario using a smaller mushroom to make the process efficient so it can be implemented. Now let's take apart this electrolyzer and see what is it made of, how does it look like inside. So if we zoom in, negative terminal, positive terminal, they're separated by a membrane, polymer usually. 
And porosity of the terminals or the catalysts are key here because we want the carbon dioxide and water diffuse around this porous media and soak up those electrons so they, we have a very efficient conversion rate. So you can see we have to uh, have a good understanding on different scale sizes to, in order to design a device that works stable and efficiently. Now, a technique we use to find the best catalyst to analyze what's going right, what's going wrong, is called characterization. That's, imagine when you receive a gift, when you're not supposed to open it, so you shake it, you mechanically stimulate it, to, and then you watch for the response, and somehow you can guess what's inside it. That's basically characterization, except that we don't just limit ourselves to mechanical stimulation, we stimulate our specimen throughout wide variety of stimuli like electrons, x-rays, ions, atoms, and we watch for the response. And we can, we can correlate that with the behavior of the system. That's called characterization. So one challenge of characterization, however, is that the act of observation always affects your specimen. So imagine if you're shaking your gift too harsh, you could just break your gift or somehow change it. So same here. So this picture I'm showing an electron microscope that we use. I photoshopped myself there so you know how tall that is. And this is the kind of a typical image that we get from that. So this white bar scale on the corner says 2 nm, 2 nanometer. Nanometer is 1 billionth of a meter, 10 to the negative 9 meter. So the size of a copper atom, let's say, just because copper is a very good catalyst for converting smoke into ethanol turns out. So the size of a copper is like about three-tenths of a nanometer, so like about that sphere, that circle over there. So we can tell these bright spots that are moving up and down, those are single atoms. And that they are moving around because the effect of our observation. With that electron microscope, we're shining an electron beam on the sample, so it's energizing the atoms and they're dancing around. So if I want to study my catalyst, my system, I have to be able to fully understand the effect of my observation on the samples. So this is one of the challenges that we face. So I hope I could give you a glance into this technology, our research, the problems we face, the challenges we're trying to solve. And I'd like to conclude with a quote from Henry Ford that reads, whether you think you can or you can't, you're right either way. And I like this quote, makes me inspired. So in this case, I got inspired and gave this prompt to artificial intelligence. I said, make me a tree made of copper that can absorb smoke from the air and produce fuel for cars. And it gave me this picture. But the point I'm trying to make here is that just like now we can recycle aluminum, we can recycle paper, we can recycle cardboards, we can also recycle carbon dioxide. It needs more research, more development, more investment. So thank you very much for your attention. I hope I could instill a bit of inspiration for, in you for generating a more sustainable society. Thank you.